in this video, we are going to be continuing talking about the reactions that are involved in the TCA cycle. Then we're going to be proceeding to talk about the control mechanisms that are involved in this process. So continuing our reaction uh, sequence in the TCA cycle. In step four, we're going to be converting alpha ketoglutarate to succinyl CoA. Understand that this is going to be done through a uh, oxidative decarboxylation reaction, meaning that alpha ketoglutarate is a five carbon system and succinyl CoA is a four carbon system. So where did that fifth carbon go? Again, this is an oxidative decarboxylation, so we are making CO2. Now, understand that the enzyme that catalyzes this reaction is going to be a complex. And this is alpha keto glutarate dehydrogenase. Okay? So this is going to be made out of three enzymes and two cofactors. And as you can see, we already seen some of these factors previously because the process of converting alpha ketoglutarate to succinyl CoA is similar to what we saw when we were trying to, um, when we observed the conversion of pyruvate to acetyl CoA. As you can see, in this process, we are needing magnesium. TPP, lipoic acid, FAD in the process. Um, in here, as you can see, we are making a reduced form of NAD. We have NADH and we are making that bond that I uh, mentioned previously. When we have a C double bond O bonded to sulfur, okay, that is known as a thio. ester bond okay the process of the conversion of alpha ketoglutarate to succinyl coa as you can see is an exergonic process which means that energy is going to be released so for the rest of the reactions we're going to see that we are going to keep these molecules at four carbon systems on step five we are converting um succinyl coa to succinate okay so here as you can see in this conversion is going to be catalyzed by the enzyme that is called succinyl coa synthetase the process by which we convert succinyl coa to succinate as you can see is an exergonic process so it's going to be releasing energy now Understand that in this process, remember that we are going to be hydrolyzing of this thioester bond, okay, to produce coenzyme A, okay? is specifically what drives the reaction because one of the things is is that the hydrolysis of that bond specifically is going to be releasing energy now understand that this is the only step in the citric acid cycle that is going to make atp so you may be looking at the reaction right now and maybe wondering but how come are we making atp as you can see here succinyl coa synthetase is going to be converting GDP, I'm just going to highlight it, is going to be converting GDP to GTP. In turn, GTP in other pathways is going to be converted into ATP. So that's why we say that on step five during the TCA cycle, we are actually making ATP. Remember, something um, that even though in the steps that I'm talking about, we're only dealing with one acetyl CoA, remember that from one molecule of glucose, what gets into the cyclin is actually two molecules of acetyl CoA. That's what we start with. Because remember, those two pyruvates get converted to two acetyl CoA. So even though right now you're looking at, oh, only one ATP molecule is made, actually two molecules of ATP are made when we're starting from one glucose. 
on step six, this is the formation of fumarate. And as you can see, fumarate is actually produced from, conversion, from converting succinate to fumarate. Okay. Now, as you can see, this is catalyzed by the enzyme succinate dehydrogenase, and this is an oxidation reaction. Understand that in this ox um, oxidation reaction, actually the delta G is zero. Now, <clears throat> this is an oxidation reaction, and again, catalyzed by uh, dehydrogenase, or in other words, an oxidative reductase, um, because overall, your molecule is going from a alkane motif to an alkene motif okay in the process we are going to be reducing FAD to FADH2 which means that we are in essence oxidizing our substrate okay this reaction to date, we cannot replicate it in the laboratory. Chemists cannot be taking alkanes to alkenes unless you have several steps. But as you can see, nature has defined a precedence for creating this type of reaction, which is very interesting as an organic chemist. On step seven, now we are going to be forming malate, specifically L-malate. Now, one of the things is that, as you can see, when we made fumarate, this is a trans alkene. Okay, just a little review on organic chemistry. And the conversion of fumarate to malate, as you can see, that is catalyzed by fumarase. Fumarase is going to do a hydration reaction. So water is added to the alkene. So in this reaction, again, this is a lyase molecule making this hydration reaction happens. As you can see, the delta G of the process is negative. So this is an exergonic process. And when it comes to creating malate, specifically it is L, um, and when it comes to this, remember that the L is determined by specifically the position of this OH in the malate molecule. The last step in the citric acid cycle is the generation of oxaloacetate. As I explained to you guys in the previous video, oxaloacetate it is actually the molecule that is utilized in the first step of the citric acid cycle. Remember, oxaloacetate is going to react with acetyl-CoA to make citrate. So remember, this is called a cycle because the product of the overall cycle, it is utilized in the first reaction. So how do we create oxaloacetate? As you can see, we make malate, um, be converted to oxaloacetate with the enzyme that is called malate dehydrogenase. And if it's a high dehydrogenase, as we have seen previously with many other dehydrogenases, these are oxidoreductase. So it makes sense that we're doing an oxidation reaction. Now, as you can see here, NAD plus is converted to NADH. And that means that specifically our malate gets converted to oxaloacetate through the process of oxidation. But if we look at the molecule itself, here we have a secondary alcohol being converted to a ketone. So it makes sense that this is an oxidation reaction. Now, as you can see here, the last step of the TCA cycle is actually an endergonic process. So you may be asking yourself, how come this endergonic process can proceed? Remember, there are many steps preceding step eight in the TCA cycle that are going to be exergonic. So 
this in the TCA cycle is the first time where we see this pairing that is utilized in biological systems or in biochemistry where you have endergonic processes being able to uh, proceed in a reaction because they are preceded by exergonic processes. So the pathway itself is generating the energy in order for these reactions to be catalyzed. Now we are going to move on to talk about the controls specific, uh, specifically of the citric acid cycle. So as you can see, there are actually three control points, okay? for the citric acid cycle or the TCA cycle. These are specifically at the level of citrate synthase. Okay, so that's when we synthesize citric acid. We do this at the level of isocitrate dehydrogenase, and that is when we make alpha ketoglutarate. And the last one is where we have alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenate complex. If we look at the image that we have on the right side, of the slide, you can see that these control points um, that I outlined here are specifically this one, this one, this one. But I also included the one that is going on before the TCA cycle starts. As we have seen previously, um, many times when these pathways are controlled, it's going to be pretty much early on in the pathway. And like in other um, reactions or pathways that we have studied previously, most of the time, all of these pathways are going to be um, regulated allosterically. Specifically here, we can observe that, again, starting Previously to the, TS, uh, the TCA cycle, when we are converting pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, that enzyme specifically is inhibited by ATP, acetyl-CoA, and NADH. When it comes to citrate synthase, as you can see, it's inhibited by ATP, NADH, succinyl-CoA, and citrate itself. So here at the level of citrate synthase, we can actually see that there's a little bit of a feedback regulation along with that allosteric regulation. When it comes to alpha keto, no, sorry, to isocitrate dehydrogenase, that is inhibited by ATP and NADH. Um, and alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase complex, that is inhibited by ATP, NADH, and actually succinyl CoA. So that one has allosteric, but in addition, um, a little bit of a feedback um, regulation. Understand that. In this process, because ultimately, as we're going to be exploring in chapter 20, we are going to be making energy in the form of ATP. All of these processes make sense that they're going to be regulated by ATP and also NADH because we're going to see its role in chapter 20 in order to make energy. Um, because if the cell has enough energy, you need to stop these pathways so your acetyl-CoA is not processed and continues to make more energy. So it makes sense that if it, there is enough ATP, these control points are going to tell the cell, hey, do not process glucose, pyruvate, and at the end of the day, acetyl-CoA through this cycle. Now, um, we are going to be talking about uh, a concept that I introduced in the previous video, which is the whole concept of catabolism. Remember, catabolism is where we go from our biomolecules to making smaller molecules. So, catabolic reactions are going to be uh, um, occurring with carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins, as I mentioned uh, in the beginning of the last video. Now, all of those processes of the carbohydrates, um, undergoing catabolic reactions, lipids and proteins actually start occurring in the cytoplasm. Because remember that I mentioned that glycolysis, again, in the case of the carbohydrate, um, when we're talking about glucose, happens in the cytoplasm. Now, the main point of this slide is for you to recognize that as you can see here, these catabolic reactions, which are going to be uh, taking place in the cytoplasm, give us molecules, okay, in the case of um, carbohydrates, lipids, and as you can see, the amino acids are uh, circled in red. 
are going to be entering the TCA cycle in order to produce energy, okay? Now, understand that many of the end products from the, these catabolic reactions have to cross into the mitochondrial membrane, and that's how they end up being cycled through the TCA cycle and ultimately, um, as we're going to see in chapter 20, undergoing oxidative phosphorylation. So, the, at the end of the day, understand that it doesn't matter if we're metabolizing carbohydrate, lipid, or proteins, meaning breaking it down to amino acids, all pathways when you're trying to make energy lead to the TCA cycle. Now, when it comes to the citric acid cycle involvement in anabolism, again, we're having small molecules and we are synthesizing biomolecules. And I already presented to you guys the example of gluconeogenesis. Understand that the citric acid cycle is, the, is a source of starting materials for the biosynthesis of many biomolecules, okay? So anytime you have a reaction that replenishes uh, citric acid cycle intermediate, understand that by definition, that is known as an anapleurotic reaction. So what we have illustrated in the graph on the right side of the slide is just illustrating how the molecules that are involved in the TCA cycle are diverted and utilized to make carbohydrates, to make fatty acids, okay? And then making amino acids, okay, that can be utilized to make proteins. Now, understand that specifically, these amino acids are going to be processed. When it comes to, uh, to us, we are not going to be synthesizing protein for metabolism. We don't have the ability to do that. The proteins that we consume are burned. So understand that this is just generating and introducing the synthesis of amino acids that can be utilized, for example, in protein synthesis. But then understand that specifically in the body, we are not going to be making protein so we can use it to generate energy. So I just wanted to make that clear. Now, one last thing that I want um, to mention is that Metabolic intermediates can be restored, okay? And in some organisms, acetyl-CoA can be converted into oxaloacetate. Understand that mammals like us cannot directly convert acetyl-CoA, okay, to pyruvate, so we cannot catalyze this reaction. Okay, so the reversal of what we just expressed that is going to happen before the TCA cycle. Um, we cannot convert acetyl-CoA to oxaloacetate. What we can do is convert pyruvate to oxaloacetate as we talked about when we were uh, mentioning gluconeogenesis. Okay, now understand that this conversion of pyruvate to oxaloacetate, which we already talked about in chapter 18, is the only way in which we can uh, introduce. So specifically, we don't have the, gly um, the gliosylate cycle, okay? We cannot convert acetyl-CoA, okay, to pyruvate, nor we can convert it to oxaloacetate. Understand that the only reaction that we can produce is the conversion of pyruvate to oxaloacetate. And the enzyme that catalyzes this conversion is going to be pyruvate carboxylate as carboxylase as we discussed in chapter 18.